right, all right, all right, all right. About 4015, what's up? Good morning, everybody. It's 54015. Good morning. I'm Chris. I'm Trey. We need we don't have our uh, yeah. we can't write on the wall, so we can't put yeah, our Twitter. That's too bad. But PC uh, Bach, at PC Bach. At PC Bach on Twitter. At Trey White. And we're uh, from 540 Consulting at 540CO, which if you're following this on Meerkat, you know that already. But if you're watching this on YouTube, that's how you can if you follow us on Twitter at, uh, at 540CO, then you'll find out about things that we're doing, including our next 54015 session. Right. This is the time we get together. Where this is our third installment. Even though it's been three weeks already. I know. This is really great. Wednesdays roll around pretty frequently. Yes, they do. So this is our third installment. We get together and talk about things that we see going on in the government, in technology, just kind of an open discussion of, of interesting topics. Trey's with me today to provide some uh, some witty banter. I did, and also, you know, as we uh, reference different things that we've either found online or whatever, we'll try to post them either on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, YouTube, on everywhere that we can. Um, so that you can follow along at home. Yeah. So um, I found a couple of interesting things to talk about this morning. Um, you know, my background is go my background is government contracting. So we, you know, one of the things we talked about when we started this was looking at Fed biz ops types of opportunities. Talk about interesting things that we're seeing. You know, kind of hitting the wire there. But actually, um, you know, as we've done this a couple of times, the, the scope has expanded a little bit. And I actually found an article. Um, in Federal Computer Week, uh, it was that came out the day before yesterday. That I thought was really, uh, really interesting. Um, it was about an initiative uh, at the National Institutes of Health, and it's a big. They launched a big data portal for Alzheimer's uh, drug research. And as I read it, one of one of the things that um, in my short time at 540, I've really become exposed to and really begun to to. Uh, become an evangelist for is the idea of um, open data and community and sharing information and this this drug portal uh, Alzheimer's is specific to Alzheimer's but it's taking that exact same concept like we see in the technology world around you know with github and um, open source and you know people sharing you know what they're finding and sharing their code it's that exact same concept applied to a different type of challenge and kind of the other I see I read those types of things and it gets me thinking about what are the other types of challenges and problems you could apply that same concept to hmm. um, and you know interestingly enough you know we're aware of a couple of other instances in the government where they're doing things like this um, you know we're very close to general services administration and a lot of work sure. that they're doing the federal acquisition service has an initiative called category hallways which is somewhat similar. It's intended to be a you know, kind of a one-stop shop for um, for government buyers to go and get information about specific commodities. Um, so it's it's a repository. It's not clear to me um, if it's going to be um, you know a community type of a situation where people are posting things to the category always, but that might be something. I don't know, if GSA, if you're out there and you're listening. And you haven't thought about taking you know sort of that next step in terms of data sharing, in terms of having people you know contracting officers out in the field, you know actually posting things you know into the hallway that can then be shared with other uh, government users. That's that's kind of an interesting concept. Right. We're also in the middle of uh, actually we're responding to an RFI that came out of DHS uh, for a, a data sharing initiative. Um, and you know, we, we obviously heard a lot, you know, about the intelligence community and law enforcement trying to better collaborate and share information. I think that's a that's a perfect use case. Yep. For something like that. And on that too, I mean, I, I know that um, though we haven't uh, we haven't been as involved in the last six six months, twelve months. Um, but you know, last time we checked in with like DIA, mm -hmm. uh, we actually went out and did a um, a conference or. Um, what is it? Just a not a conference, but we had a table. It was a whole like um, uh, industry day. That's what I was looking for. Type of a thing, um, <clears throat> and they have this thing set up where um, if they want, if you want to just help, you know, the community aspect of it, they'll post. Hey, we need this small little something, mm -hmm. and I think they actually call it like the Needapedia or the something like that. 
um, that where they'll they'll post uh, little things that you can help and just allow the community to collaborate and, and support some of their some of their mission. Break break, you know. Obviously, if you're if you're a company and you're interested, you know that's one way to get your foot in the door is yeah. just to kind of volunteer some help and get them uh, fixing some small things. But I think just like just like that, there are a lot of opportunities where in you know, that GitHub style approach. Uh, yeah. We so can help, so help it got me thinking things. about you know what are some of the other big problems that we're mm -hmm. facing. Um, you know, I thought about one thing. I thought about was climate change. And I know NOAA has tons of climate related data that they make available for researchers. Through um, through their website, uh, but I, I thought you know kind of even more specifically, you know, there's all this news about the, the drought in California, and is there a way to use that same sort of concept to further you know that sort of that sort of research? Yeah, I always think whenever I think of Noah, I'm always thinking of that movie. Uh, day after tomorrow or something, uh, where they're, yeah. they're measuring the buoy, where the buoy is going yeah. up and down. <laughs> is that data available? We'll have to check. Yeah, it yeah, is. It is. Just... Yeah, if you go if you go to the NOAA website, there's they have tons of data available. I actually pulled, I actually pulled some of it down just to look at it and and see what uh, you know. I, I couldn't really make a lot of sense out of it, but you know, there's you know all of that all of the all that sensor data is out there. But you know, are there other you know researchers that are gathering data about Climate. And like I said, specifically to the, the drought in California, which is obviously in the news. Right. You know, what sort of collaboration is going on around trying to, to solve those hmm. those problems? That's interesting. So maybe you could take things like uh, uh, lake levels or, you know, I mean, obviously. Well, I mean, there's there's lake levels, there's uh, water consumption data. Oh, yeah, yeah. Different, you know, municipalities, the different, yeah, the, yeah. you know, different. Uh, you know, water boards that they have in, in California, um, crop outputs. I mean, there's all these, you know, these these cause and effect. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, types of types of you know relationships, and you know, I'm not saying that that there's you know necessarily a, a solution to the drought because there's not only anything you can do about that, but in terms of mitigating the impacts of it, yeah. and you know, finding innovative ways to you know. Help California kind of get through this period. Now, obviously, sure. there are a lot of smart people in California, so I'm sure, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the first person that's that's thought of that. <coughs> but you can't make it. You can't make those good decisions if you don't have the data that you need, right? And so it's all about that's making exactly, sure all exactly. that's available. Yeah. Now, another potential use case I thought of was, you know, like um, at FDA, you know, because it takes, uh, you know, the the cycle time for drug research and you know, getting drugs approved through FDA. You know, I thought that, you know, there might be some application there. Department of Agriculture. I thought about them from the perspective of you know they get massive amounts of data uh, from their inspectors, um, and I don't know whether or not they also take any sorts of inputs from um, you know food producers mm -hmm. or retailers or consumers, and, and you know what sorts of, of interesting and useful um, research that they could potentially do right. if they had. All that data in kind of a community sort of a sort of environment, right? Uh, yep. So just uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting topic. Very cool. Yeah. And even looping back to just for a split second on the Alzheimer research too. And last week we touched on another um, healthcare related topic. Mm -hmm. You know, with the pill identification. Yeah. Um, RFI. I think that was an RFI. Um, that medical space <laughs> seems to have the most. Um, one okay, maybe not the most, but some of the most applications or opportunities right now um, to help, and you know, with the v, with with uh, yeah. NIH, with uh, HHS, with VA. I'm seeing a lot of things come out of those guys, VAH. Yeah. And, um, and you know, I, I, as and as I think about, you know, it, it's you know a little bit of a departure from you know kind of our typical capitalist model. And we've talked on this on our five forty fifteen session before about you know how you know. I mean, when you create something or find something, you know, our tendency is to protect it, right, know, and not share it because it's a trade secret. It's you know, it could be a differentiator. But when it's an altruistic cause like Alzheimer's research, everybody wants to find a cure to this horrible disease sure. and you know help treat people. And um, I think it's easier to kind of get you know the community yep. behind it. You know, another. You know, potential use case I thought of was you know Department of Energy, um, and 
research around you know alternative fuels and alternative energy sources and energy um, conservation and, and those, those types of, of topics but there's a huge business aspect to that and, sure you know there are companies and organizations that make a lot of money uh, by you know they make some some <coughs> that that's a you know that's a trade secret and how do you sort of balance that and I think the tech community has kind of gotten past that and so is there a way to get you know other lines of business so to speak to move sometimes and I mean I think maybe I live in the well, mother, yeah, motherhood and apple pie world. <laughs> well, no, rainbows and unicorns. Yeah, exactly. Um, I still, you know, you'll still see all these big fights between some of the big tech firms, too. And yeah. I think it can be counterproductive. And move it. I agree. I think that completely stunts innovation, right? And that's yeah. why, um, for whoever watches uh, the Shark Tank, um, you know, Mark Cuban will always say uh, that the, pat the, the way that we do patents in this country. Um, just stunts innovation on yeah. this, and the way that you, know, you protect some of that intellectual property. And it's not that you shouldn't be able to protect your intellectual property, it's there's got to be a balance between just completely saying that um, my ball get off my lawn type thing and um, and helping others innovate, I think. So there's yeah. a balance. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the second topic I wanted to bring up, and this is also something out of NIH, this is you know, a complete shift of gears from, from what I, I mentioned earlier. Um, they put out a source of sought notice. Um, it came out on FedBiz Ops uh, the end of last week. Source of saw is due May 15th, so uh, if John O'Brien is out there, uh, the due date is May 15th. Um, we're keeping us on task. Yeah, keep them, making sure we got the dates on there. Uh, but it, interestingly enough, it's for um, uh, support of NIH runs um, some pretty heavily used. Uh, contract vehicles in the federal space. Um, there's one called CIO SP3, okay. which is heavily used by a number of agencies. They also have a small business version of that. Uh, they have something called the Electronic Commodity Store, and then they have another um, uh, commodities vehicle called CIO CS. And so this RFI is a source of sought to provide basically kind of all the <coughs> Kind of front and back office support for those contract vehicles, right? And it's you know it's website, it's managing um, finance and accounting, acquisition support, portfolio management, project management, marketing, everything associated with it, right? But right in the middle of their RFI is their OCI notice. Anybody that holds <laughs> one of those contract vehicles or is a subcontractor on one of those vehicles. Is precluded from participating, huh. and I just went and I just pulled the primes. Two hundred—that's two hundred and twelve companies, and it's all of the big ones. So you know, because everybody wants to hold these contract vehicles, particularly CIO SB three, because they are very popular with agencies. I know the Army uses CIO SB three a lot for a lot of their information technology um, uh, procurements, and so you know, all of the big. SIs and you know a huge number of small businesses right. are precluded from competing on this. And I so understand. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad? Thing? What do you think? Well, why do you think they did that? Well, I mean, I understand the you know the importance of of OCI and the um, you know the reasoning behind doing it in sure. this case is the fact that you're going to be you know, running the systems that manage these contract vehicles. Therefore, you're going to have access. You company are going to have access to sensitive proprietary contracting information. It right. may be pre-award type information, it may be company specific information, so you could get theoretically get access to some of your competitors' rate information and, and things that could be considered business sensitive, which again, I get that, but it also, I mean, it really hamstrings the government in terms of their ability, you know, it goes back to, to innovating and getting access to, you know, the you know the best talent and things like that and I, I noticed this is a source of sought I didn't research to see but I'm sure this is you know they have an incumbent and they're doing a source of sought to see you know are there any other companies out there that can do this I'm guessing the answer would, would always be yes well but they won't get very many they may not get very many responses from companies that are really qualified to do because the scope of this is pretty big mm -hmm. but if you sign up to do this you're basically saying okay I'm gonna sign up to do this and ignore the whole rest of the government in terms of contracting work that comes to this vehicle. And there aren't 
you know, a lot of companies that are necessarily going to want to restrict their, um, you know, restrict their growth or restrict their opportunity to compete for other agency work because of that. Right. And you know, I know that um, um, you know, in some OCI organizational conflict of interest situations, there's an opportunity to put firewalls in place and mitigation plans to to help you know kind of prevent you know one company from getting access to another company's information but I, I think this is you know this is you know, <coughs> this is an example of kind of a uniquely government situation that that does create um, a, a barrier to innovation and you know it, it also creates a situation where it limits competition, which is which is you know in general not necessarily a good thing. No, definitely, definitely the first part, but the second part too, yeah. yeah. So I don't know, you know, I'm not here saying I have an answer, you know, because this is OCI is something that's been around forever. But I think it's it doesn't get a whole lot of attention in terms of you know are there better ways to handle organizational conflicts of interest? You know, obviously protecting. The agencies um, protecting the companies that you know have their data or their you know their sensitive business information in these systems. Also, I mean the purpose behind OCI is also to protect um, the government from uh, organizations that maybe don't have good intentions you know, right. or they're that are um, you know nefarious in terms of you know taking you know another company's data and then using it to their advantage. Obviously, that's that's important too. Right? Right? Is there you know, are there any ways? Are there any ways to get around that? That's a hard one. Yeah. Yes, and we run into that a lot in, in some of the projects that we work on um, these days. Right, uh, some competition sensitive data, mm -hmm. some uh, pre decisional data, yeah. and, um, and and I mean, I, and I can tell you, coming from you know, I, I, before I joined Five Forty, I worked for a large systems integrator organization that also happened to have a hardware and software business. If you go on LinkedIn and uh, look me up, Christopher Bach on LinkedIn, you'll see who that company is. I won't name them, but it's not the big black box. No, it's not the big black box. Okay, uh, that's where I am now. Yeah. Um, but I know as we would go through bid no bid decisions, it was always a concern. You know, are we going to have access to information that could potentially create a conflict of interest that could possibly preclude us from bidding on something down the road? And in our in our case, um, at that company um, I was focused on services but we had this you know this hardware and software component to our business and we purposefully walked away from from deals where we could have we could have proposed and we could have brought real talent to the table to help the government you know improve its operations but we walked away because it might have prevented us from selling Hardware or some other part of the government. You guys look at it in terms of our, like a ri risk. Of absolutely, bid. absolutely, right. and it was a part of our, our bid no bid yeah. um, decision mm -hmm. process. That's interesting. And I, you know, again, like like I said, I, I think it um, it prevented us. You know, that's not to say that there weren't other companies out there that could also bring talent to the table. Sure, but it's a concern and, and it limits competition. Right. Up. All right, Trey. Before we go to the last topic, is there anything on your mind? Anything you'd like to talk about? Um. No, I'm not really, you know, obviously I kind of uh, uh, hopped in at the last minute here. Um, I, 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 like to be, I, like front, I like to be in front of the camera. You know, last, the thing that I was thinking about was, you know, um, yeah, you made it. Last, last week we talked a little bit about meetup, uh, meetups and how important I think they are um, to, to get involved, get, get uh, in the conversation and just uh, talk about things. Obviously what we're most passionate about are data solutions mm -hmm. and, and um, more specifically from a technical perspective, APIs, and of course, when we say APIs, we mean the rest ones, um, typically. Um, so, what I just wanted to do was give maybe a quick shout out to a couple of conferences that we like to go to, um, just to put them on your radar. You know, look them up. Uh, we've been to most of these, or if not, plan to go to some of them. But um, you have uh, API Strat, which is a, a conference put on by Ken Lane. We mentioned him last week too, the API evangelist. Um, so uh, they tend to have about two conferences a year, I feel. One of them is usually in the States and one of them in Europe. I, sometimes I just think Ken likes to travel around the world. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think there might be, the next one might be in the September time frame. I hope I'm right on that. Um, there's also Glucon, which is another API or data-centric um, 
conference. Um, I'm, I've considered going to that one this year as well. It's out in the Denver area, um, or in Colorado at least. Um, it's pretty solid. Um, a lot of the same players go to these conferences. And then there's also API Craft and the Data World or something, and that one usually goes on out in California, which is another good conference. Uh, maybe we can kind of post uh, links to those conferences. But I mean, um, if you want to learn more about <laughs> How, how to solve these problems and what are the tools that are available yeah. that we have in our tool belt to, to, um, to help collaborate, to help build these API data communities, to help solve some of these hard problems like uh, what you mentioned in terms of maybe Alzheimer research or drought support. Mm -hmm. um, you gotta know what tools are available to build those solutions and the conferences are some of the best places to do that and just have open conversations about what people are doing. So those three conferences, and obviously there's like a million conferences we can yeah. go to, uh, but those are some of the ones that uh, yeah. we've- We heard about on. one that's coming up next month, it's a little closer to home here in DC. The, uh, our friends from uh, Amazon Web Services are having their conference in June, I think it's the 25th and 26th <coughs> in DC. Um, they haven't published an agenda yet, at least not that I've seen, um, but they have open registration. It's free to attend. Um, I, I know we're planning on sending, yeah, the price is right. so, yeah, sending at least a couple of folks to uh, right. to uh, learn about um, what they're doing. Sure. So, um, if you if there's anybody out there that participated in or, or viewed 540 15 uh, round one, um, I wrapped up with uh, a conversation about throwable it, robots. Throwable robots, my favorite. So as I was preparing for today, I was like, yeah, how am I going to wrap this up? So I've decided that from now. From until eternity, but when I'm on uh, on stage here at 5:40:15, I'm going to give. I'm going to provide I'm, I'm a calling, robot update. I'm calling it the Skynet News Update. <laughs> okay, so it's a little yeah column how, Yeah, how 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 much progress have we made towards the machines becoming self-aware? So last time it was uh, throwable robots. This is another uh, robot uh, opportunity. I uh, saw this on uh, on FedBizOps. Uh, it is from the Department of the Navy, um, and it is uh, a market research RFI, and um, it's for something called a symmetric, <laughs> symmetric dual arm manipulator. So, uh, um, uh, what, what do we think? That's something that can so, pick something up, maybe? Exactly. Or? So, okay. um, it's actually uh, an, a, you know, for an interesting you know, mission. Um, Explosive Ordnance Disposal, oh, of course. EOD. They have these robots and they look like little tanks that roll along the ground. Well, the ones I have now only have one arm, single arm, and so they can perform some tasks, but it, there are obviously other tasks that it can't perform. So this is an RFI to come up with, I guess, ways to to, um, to retrofit or to have these robots have two arms. Why well, stop at two? Let's go to eight. I'm sure that's coming. Yeah. But um, you know the you know they said you know the, the the current robots can do certain things, but it can't, for example, pick something up and like unscrew a top. And so they it. want to have that kind of capability. I feel so, like I've seen uh, maybe it's the movies and maybe it's not a real thing, but you know I'm thinking NASA. I'm thinking I'm thinking some of those space rovers. They have some mm -hmm. of those two arm things. Yeah. So, maybe, so I, I I'm sure this is, I wouldn't think that would be a, a, a terribly difficult challenge to. Um, to meet with all the things that you know, all the advancements that we've made in, sure. in robotics, but you know, I think it's uh, you know, certainly uh, um, an interesting use case and us moving one step closer yeah. towards the T1000. Maybe it's so, just a matter of time. <laughs> Maybe the next one's actually the dr a drone. We don't, you know, a drone that comes in and picks it up and can take it up to, you know, twenty thousand feet and you know safely unscrew it and you know. That's an interesting idea, or maybe, or, yeah, or I was gonna say you could drop it in the ocean, but that wouldn't be eco-friendly, I suppose. Some people would get upset about that. Because there was, yeah, yeah, probably so. That's cool. Yeah, I like the robot corner, Skynet, Skynet corner. Yes. What is it? Skynet, the Skynet news update. Skynet news update. So uh, continue to tune into five forty fifteen to learn about our new technology yeah. uh, overlords. Whenever, but whenever box on, we get to hear the cool yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, I want to thank everybody for joining us this morning. Again, I'm Chris. I'm Trey. At PC Bach. At Trey White. At 540CO. We will look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Same that's time. Always, that's same seven days away. Seven days away. Yeah. Time to start working on new content. All right. All right. Come on. Thanks for joining us out. See you guys. See you guys.